do that. So if you have, if you have tutored in October, November, or December and not turned in hours, let me know. It may be that you stopped tutoring in October or November and we accidentally forgot to send you forms or you thought we didn't need it because you were still did tutoring in December, but we actually really do need the information. Um, so I'm bugging you about that. Um, you, your neighbors, your friends, if you need to submit the hours reports, please do that. Um, we will turn them around right away and enter them in our database. We are just waiting for the return of our speaker. So if you want to get up and get some more food or you want to get something to drink, um, feel free. Know that um, in the back corner of the room is our about pronunciation, helping particularly adult learners who are English language learners, and that means English is not their first language, learn how to pronounce better. So for many of you, you do work with English language learners. Some of you don't, but it's a great opportunity to build your skills. And our wonderful presenter today, <laughs> Bonnie Blakely, who's known actually to a bunch of people in this room. I yes, think. I'm looking around and finding more. How neat. And you yeah. want fan clubs because those people were our fan clubs. <laughs> <laughs> so Bonnie's doing the word talk. So Bonnie is an experienced instructor yeah. of both Spanish and English as a second language. Right. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Through adult education at right. Santa Barbara City College. And I know some of you have participated in her classes in a variety of ways. Many of you have taken Spanish from her. Um, some of you may have even traveled with her. I know my boss. Oh, yeah. Um, I don't know. She knows you're here today. We'll make sure she stops ah. by. Um, and Bonnie is here with a whole wonderful wealth of material to help us um, as tutors with some of the problems we encounter <coughs> tutoring, working with English language learners. And, and we're not all skilled professionals, and so we have a lot of questions. And one of the things I hope will happen today is that you will feel free to ask Bonnie oh, yeah. um, <laughs> as many questions as you like relating to your own experience or just general questions, because really that's the point of this workshop, for you guys to get a chance to have your questions answered. Um, so I'm delighted, Bonnie, that you could come and donate your time. We really appreciate this. Oh, my pleasure. This is a significant donation of your time, and um, we'd like you to meet as a representative sampling, but this is really um, only about 20% of our wow. active tutors, um, and maybe less. How many people in the room? Okay, so yeah, no, it's, it's probably less, maybe wow. 15 to 20 percent. So at any point, we have about 100 to 150 active tutors in the program. Um, so believe me, there's a lot of interest. That's great. In your workshop. Thank you. So thank you. Thank you. It is a privilege to be here, and <coughs> you guys are doing such wonderful things. Uh, you're make, doing life-changing things for people. So kudos to you. It's just awesome what you're doing. Um, so I'm happy if there's anything I can do to help out in that a little bit. Um, and as Bev said, please feel free to ask questions, interject, give your own ideas. I'm, I'm not, I don't have any degrees in um, English pronunciation. The only thing I'm bringing to you is what I've learned over the years from doing it for many, many years and from going to lots of conferences and observing lots of teachers and stealing all their good ideas to share with you. So uh, what I have is not, um, you know, major um, groundbreaking stuff, but it's what seems to work. And that's from a lot of experience. So on the first part on your, everybody has your purple sheet, right? The first item there says differing opinions about teaching pronunciation. Is anybody aware of the idea that there are different opinions about it? It's a big debate in the ESL world whether or not we should even teach pronunciation. Some people feel that we should not really do that because they feel that we are in somehow way diminishing someone's culture. And I totally disagree with that. Be because when you teach pronunciation, you give people a choice. You, by teaching pronunciation and intonation and accent reduction, you're not saying you can't speak that way. You're giving them a choice to speak another way. And so to me, anything you're doing to give someone a choice is a good thing. So um, I totally disagree with the idea that we shouldn't do it. Now, if somebody doesn't want it, you can't do it. You know, it's not going to work. So I gave you some reasons. It gives a choice. It increases their comprehensibility. And by increasing their comprehensibility, it increases their confidence. I think there, I was trying to figure this out actually this morning, going, why did I get into this myself? Why am I so into pronunciation? And I think it happened, what really kind of got me interested was many years ago when I was studying Spanish in Mexico, living with a family and with other students from the United States, one of the gals spoke 
fluent Spanish, but her pronunciation was so English that I had to make phone calls for her um, to speak to the operator back when you had to do everything through an operator because nobody could understand her. And I thought, what a shame that she had spent all this time learning this language and she couldn't be understood. So that kind of got me especially interested in it. Um, it, of course, helps students understand each other when you're in a classroom situation or just non-native speakers understand each other. And it increases their opportunities here. And when I say others, do you have any other reasons why would you want to teach pronunciation? Don't you want to know what the baseline pronunciation of a language is supposed to be? Basic or Oh, you mean of a different language? No, of just English. Oh. I would want to know what basically how people say the word. Oh, of course. I mean, you would just think you'd want to know. Yeah. It would be natural to right. have that as part of the language. Well, also, there are certain words that um, we all know that if you have the wrong pronunciation, <laughs> <laughs> and I have students who come up to me and say, I'm having problems with my vowels. <laughs> and I'm like, uh, and I'm, vowels is what they're trying to say, yes. And uh, it's like, uh, my first reaction is, did you talk to a doctor? And I'm like, oh no, we're talking to me as an English teacher. So yes, exactly, um, uh, to avoid a few embarrassing situations. Uh-huh, anything else? Well, and of course, that's one of the things we'll, we'll touch on here is the different, that there are different ways that are totally acceptable to pronounce words in this country. Yep. <laughs> There's a CH in Spanish. There isn't an SH. Right. Mm -hmm. And, you know, we're working on that, but I don't want to press it too much because the woman from up front on the left and I want to say, well, you know, no puedo hacerlo. I just can't do it. <laughs> and that is a biggie right there. Right. Getting that yes, you can attitude is a huge okay. amount of learning. Yeah. And so when we get to, um, after the, the tools and techniques for specifics, then ask me any specific sounds you'd like to work on. And we'll do that then, okay? So, um, all right, we'll move on then. We've got why we should teach it. I think we agree that we should and that you're here. And when should you do it? If you have the opportunity, I think it's a good idea to do regularly as a topic, but also whenever the um, opportunity presents itself. When the student is reading with you and you notice a problem, that's a good time to work with that problem. <laughs> Um, on number four here, I, I, I want to really, really, really emphasize that you have to emphasize with your students the need for dedicated practice to make improvement. You can teach that student to pronounce beautifully right there in front of you, but then unless that student keeps practicing that skill, a week later or whenever your interval is, it's going to be gone. And so they have to practice regularly. It's not something you just get because language is a habit. It just kind of comes out and they will go right back to their old habits. So that's something you have to really work with them on. And the other thing is both for you as tutors and for your students is to become aware of what you when you're speaking are doing with your mouth. And where is language coming from? Where are the sounds coming from? They're not all from our voice. Some are from our nose, some are from our lips and our tongue, and so they're produced different ways. So I suggest, in the privacy of your own homes, <laughs> actually do this in the shower, is just pronounce things, say things, and pay attention to what you're doing when you're doing it. And I, I mean, literally, I'll be in there washing and going, you know, very, very, or whatever it is I'm working on. And pay attention to what is happening with your own mouth so that you can explain it to somebody else. Because when it comes out of you totally naturally, many of you probably haven't thought about it. If you, are, if, if you have learned another language or have taught another language, you're more likely to have thought about it. But if you pretty much are monolingual English, it's not likely that you really think about what you're doing with your tongue and your lips and all that when you say things. Somewhere, Bonnie, are you going to address how to make that 
if you want to distract from something else, but the real time feedback loop that they had with you, are you going to talk about how you can make that? Encourage them to do that practicing. Well, the, and yes, I will talk about how to encourage them to do the practicing. Yes. Exactly, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, we will get down to that pretty soon. So let's go right into the tools and techniques. The first thing I use is a vowel chart. Oh, and I, let's see if this guy will go on. It doesn't really matter if it doesn't because you've got the words down there. And... Um, It'll come on and be happy. It worked a few minutes ago. <laughs> this is something you can just put on a piece of paper. I wrote them out for you in your handout. It says, you see it, say yes, fat bird, bus stop, two books, show the boss, hi, cowboy. You've got all your English vowels in there and diphthongs, which is a combination of two vowels, the I, ow, oi, yeah. Uh, well, let's see if it's going to, yep, there we go. It's bouncing around, but there it is. So what I like to do with this, and I think it's a really useful tool, is to work frequently with students and get them to say these words really, really well. Because if they can say these words really, really well, they have all the vowels. And then when they try to say um, a word that doesn't come out right, let's think of one. Uh, they maybe they say they want to say is and they say ease. You'll say no. It's like the it and it. Because they have that one word, it, in their, in their repertoire. So I work with them to work on these words over and over until they get them well. It's in the very first, this is right, in, right here in the first purple line. The first line under tools and techniques, the vowel sound chart. So the words are right there. You don't need to write them down. But I like to make it like a little chart when I work with them. And then I'll also do it without the words. I'll do ooh, ooh, ee, e, a, e, a, er, a, a, u, u, o, a, a, i, ow, oi. So they work with the sounds and then connect those sounds to a specific word. And when they're missing, Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yep. Uh, drawings to show the tongue position and the movement. So I do. I'm not an artist, but I can copy off of out of books or out of the inter internet. So I made up these drawings to help them show where they're putting their tongue. In this case, the L and the R. Whatever sound it is, we're working on. And then I just have, can pull these out when we need them. Very handy. And I'll watch them just play with it with their own. So with the er, our tongue is being pulled back. With the oh, it's pushed forward. Now, there are within English a couple different ways. Some people make the L up a little higher, some a little lower. I actually try to teach the L. I teach them to put it down, put the tip of the tongue under the tooth, because it gets that tongue down and forward. Otherwise, they want to pull it back. This, of course, is especially with our Asian population difficulty. But the R and the L are hard for a lot of languages, <laughs> Spanish as well, because they're pronounced differently in Spanish. So I make these drawings up. We have our short I, long E. And you can get these out of very uh, many different pronunciation books. You can, yeah, there are, or websites. Yes. You can we get can pictures of these. Stock, but in fact, going to a website where you can print it off and then have it. Yeah. Um, so I find the drawings handy. Sometimes it helps them to see that. But um, what's even better now is the website I'm going to show you. <laughs> this is a lot of fun. Uh, your address is there in your handout, but I brought it up here. And you just choose. Um, Now, if you're not into linguistics, you may not know what these, these things mean here, but that's okay because it, when you click on different things, it'll tell you a fricative. A fricative is a consonant produced by forcing the breath stream through a constriction formed by articulators in the vocal tract. Huh? Okay. <laughs> so 
So maybe that's a little difficult. But fricative means the air is flowing. Stop means it stops it. <laughs> and uh, we have different sites. Uh, all different, uh, what do you call it, sounds, depending on sometimes they're fricative, sometimes they're stopped. Here we have, they say, here are the labial dental sounds, the F or the V. Labial dental with the lip and the tooth. Or so let's say you're having trouble getting your student to make that F to use their bottom lip. Oh, let's see, do we have sound? Fa. Fa. Food. Oh, we can make her make it too. So you got the sounds, you got the visual, you got the inside of the mouth. This is an awesome website. Yeah, Let's look at the V. <coughs> and it's so fun. The one in Spanish, you can practice your Spanish with that too. Especially the, the trilled R is a lot of fun. They, they have a great time with that. <laughs> Everybody laughs at that one. Fa. Fa. No, because it's it's really hard to do a pronunciation without any sound after it. So I would tend I tend to do that too. We'll use what's kind of a short U or schwa. Schwa is the most common sound in English. It's the sound that we make when we're not emphasizing a um, syllable, and it you don't know what letter it is. You can't tell what letter it is. All letters, all vowels can be schwa. I'll show you a little, some examples a little later. So then I, we tend to do a schwa after that just uh, sound almost like a short U, teensy bit different from a short U. Uh, <laughs> so anyway, this is a fun website. You can, you can play with with your students and get them to play with on their own. And let me point out, actually, especially for you, uh, you who may be tutoring in the Central Library, that now that we have computer reservations, if you have a time that you're coming in with your student, it's not like the old first come, first serve computer system. So if you know that you meet on Wednesday from three to four, you can actually reserve a half an hour, two half hour blocks consecutively, and go and you can get headphones um, and sit together at one, you know, you're at the common computer station with a round oak carol, but you can reserve that time now um, at this library. The other libraries don't have that computer registration system, um, although you can ask at the desk if you can reserve a specific time. It's worth asking. Can I ask All you how you speak to the Spanish interpretation? Oh. Because you might prefer the word back and forth. Uh, let's see if I went take out the, well, I, yeah, yeah, I would probably bring it up again and go uh, to the Iowa website and put in Spanish oh, instead of English. Yeah. yeah. And then you could, if you had you both of them, you forth. could go back and forth. Yeah. So anyway, this is a lot of fun and very useful. And okay, we'll bring this guy down here. Um, so that was our, our cool website. Ah, strips of fa paper to puff the P or the WH. I just get them have a little strip of paper, of paper, because in English we push out our P's like we do not in Spanish. In Spanish, pa, pa, pa. In English, papa. So uh, getting to push out the B or the P or the WH, these are handy, that's a handy little tool. Very easy to have. Not very expensive. Um, mirrors and CDs. These, we call these nerd mirrors. My husband's a computer nerd, and I went to pick him up at work, and he picked up one of these and combed his hair. <laughs> it's like, but they craft them around because, and I want you to just play with, look at them because the good thing about these, if you want, let's say you're working on that V, and you're sh you can show them a thousand times the, 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 and they'll go, you know, and not get it until they see what they're doing at the same time. So if they have this in front of their face, they can see it. Now what's nice about this, rather than a real mirror, is they're not 100% clear, so one doesn't see every little defect in there, you know, and they don't start, ooh, you know? It, so it's a little bit fuzzy, but it shows you your mouth, which is fine, and also only shows the mouth if you hold it right, and you're not distracted, or they're not distracted by looking at themselves so much. It's just the mouth. So you can be right in front of them. They've got their thing like this, and you can show them that mm, they imitate you with this and using their mirrors. And you all get these things right in the mail or have old CDs around. 
So this is a nice little tool. One of the teachers mentioned this. I've always used mirrors, and she said, these are great. It's like, yes, <laughs> these look, work great. Yeah, and it's one of those, you always, we had a pile. This was what the other thing, too. We had this pile of them at home. What are we going to do with these? And uh, my husband's a pack rat. He won't throw anything away. And he had this, like, stack. And uh, finally, I had a use for them. So <laughs> I had to admit he was right, which wasn't nice. But you have to do that once in a while. Um, mirrors and CDs. Silent repeating. Um, you can have one if you want. And if not, pass it back because, you know, we usually people have them. It's up to you. But I wanted you to see how they work. We throw away lots of them at the library. So if you want me to look through the <laughs> Probably get some, right. Silent repeating, <coughs> excuse me, is saying the word without saying the word. So, for example, I'm working on the B and the V, so I will have them repeat after me. Best and vest without the sound. So it's just the visual. And to get them to pronounce it well, I might have both words up and I will have, let's say, one on one side of me and one on the other. You would just put two on a piece of paper. You go, and they point to which one it is. See if they're getting that connection between the and is a B and the is a V. And then you have them do it, and you point to what they do and gives them the clue of whether they have got it. Without the sound, without the meaning getting in the way, it's just the getting that <coughs> picture of what your mouth is doing. So I find that actually is really a useful thing, repeating without saying anything. Um, how far along do you feel the student has to be before they start doing this method? The earlier the better. Because the more English they speak, the more interference they get. The, more, the longer you've had a habit that isn't a good habit, the harder it is to break. And they call it fossilization, that sometimes our our things get fossilized. They're really hard to, to eliminate. So the earlier the better. Thank you. Yeah, definitely. Okay. Yes? I think you mean just getting that sound time. I, I think it, it kind of has Yeah, but and sometimes they'll go together. And of course, sometimes they won't. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah, so sometimes you can work it in there. When you have those rules that do work well, you can work it in there. Um, rubber band. Yeah, me. We use a rubber band to, and the student holds a rubber band in their hand to stretch out those sounds so that they are saying beach when they are supposed to be saying beach because we stretch that e, e, and just have them do it e, 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 and um, because as you pointed out, it doesn't come out with that long e. And so it helps them stretch. It's a physical, kinesthetic learning thing, helping them stretch the sound. And um, then they don't have to have the rubber band in their hand. They may still find themselves doing this at first. And then it will eventually go away. But the sound will be there. So that's another little tool for you to help them stretch that long E sound. Any long sounds that uh, you need to work on. Feel under your throat. Ah, let's all do that. Take your hand and put it right in here. And you, I want you to feel if you're using your voice or not. So if you could do this, go. <coughs> you feel any vibration? Yes. No. That's called an unvoiced sound. We don't use our voice for that. We're producing that right here. But there's <coughs> Feel the vibration, right? Sometimes it helps a student to get the, those sounds because there are students who do not hear the difference between zzz and s. And at the ends of words, Lots of times when we're adding an S, they're supposed to voice it and they don't. So it helps to help, you know, get them feel what they're doing. So that's for voiced and unvoiced sounds. Under your mouth, ah, right here, under here, go E, E, tightens up in there. You feel your muscles? Now it is much more relaxed. Ooh, uh, so I'll do ooh, uh, uh is relaxed. Ooh, is tense. So play with the sounds and your hands and figure out what you're doing. And it can help your students with that, too, especially the short sounds. Those are hard ones, getting the mouth relaxed. Uh, feel under the mouth. Feel your lips or around the mouth. English is very relaxed. Our lips and our face are very relaxed in English. 
And students sometimes, from depending on where they're from, but they need to learn to relax this. Make it soft, not, not tense and tight. If you tighten up your tongue and tense, you're going to talk like this. <laughs> yeah, so, which are, of course, teaching Spanish, you want to teach them to tighten and tense up. But teaching English, you want to relax the mouth. So sometimes, actually, you know, a little touch. You got to depend on your relationship with your students on whether you're touching them or they're just themselves. But um, do what works. But that's another thing to help get the idea of relaxing our mouth for English, because that is a real biggie in English: is getting students to relax the mouth. Nonsense sentences to improve intonation. I'm not talking, <coughs> excuse me, about any words. I'm talking about just sounds. Example: da 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 da. Everybody, da, 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 Hi, my name is Bonnie. Then you put in the words. So you practice that, because otherwise you're going to, hi, my name is Bonnie. You know, it's going to have the flat, if they're for Spanish speakers, depending on what language they're from. So I get them to practice some just nonsense sounds, then put in the words and have them keep that intonation. And it seems to really help. And in a classroom situation, what I've noticed will happen is the first two or three do it really well, and then it starts falling back into the old habits. So you have to keep on it. But, but you, you don't have to say anything. You're just giving them the sounds mm -hmm. of English. Oh, I'm sorry I didn't bring a certain disc. There is a, um, a wonderful it, podcast you can probably find. And ooh, I may have to email Bev on the specifics. <laughs> It's called Radio Lab is the TV program. It's something that would come on NPR. Mm -hmm. And there was one about the music of English. Mm -hmm. And there was a music, uh, excuse me, a, a professor. I don't even remember, a linguistics perhaps. Anyway, professor was recording little teeny pieces of sentences. Mm -hmm. And one time she had it in a loop playing over and over again in order to pick some little piece out. And all of a sudden she thought she heard somebody, she was busy doing other things, forgot she had it going. She thought she heard music. And sure enough, when it was done over and over, this little piece, it was music. And once you got it at music, it's hard to get it away from being music. Each language has its own music. And English has our, we have our music. And so doing that nonsense sentence gives them that little piece of music to work on. Um, yeah, I'm sorry I forgot about that, bringing that in. It was something I recently acquired. It's really cool. We are now, oh, dialogues and jazz chants to improve intonation and rhythm. Um, a dialogue, you know what that is. You know about dialogue. So you have a written dialogue, you haven't practiced. Jazz chants are poem type things. For example, one of my favorites that I like to use in teaching English is called personal questions because it has a lot of useful questions and also it has a good thing to say when you don't want to answer these questions. So it goes like this. Where were you born? I'd rather not say. Where are you from? I'd rather not say. How old are you? How tall are you? How much do you weigh? I'd rather not say. How much rent do you pay? I'd rather not say. It goes on and on like this, with personal questions and then learning to say, I'd rather not say. So jazz chants can work on that intonation and rhythm in a language. And you can do them. Um, we have them both here. Oh, good. Jazz chants book, but where else can we get them? Well, I, uh, you make up your own, uh, depending on what you're working on. I made up two. They're not great, but they serve a purpose. Uh, I wanted to work on the I, the short I, long E, I and E. So one's called Jim, and it's where's Jim? Jim's on a trip. Jim's on a trip? Yes, Jim's on a trip on a ship. On a ship? Yes, Jim's on a trip on a ship with his kids. With all six kids? Yes, with all six kids. Now it's all that I, 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 I. The next one is Jean, longer. What's Jean doing? Jean's eating. What's Jean eating? Jean's eating ice cream. Ice cream? Yes, Jean's eating ice cream with her team. With what team? With her baseball team. So it's just getting the N, E over and over. But you do it with a little rhythm, and that makes it more interesting than just repeating over and over if you make it like a poem I'm kind of thing. I'm confused here how you use that. Uh, are you saying that, or, you, or is the learner saying that? Yeah, I say it, they repeat. Say, repeat, say, repeat until they get it really well. Then maybe one person takes one one part, like one person asks the questions, where were you born? I'd rather not say. Where are you from? I'd rather not say. Take turns being different parts. Because the jazz chants tend to have two parts to them, kind of a question and response or a sentence and response. And so, but first, you have to just say it and have them repeat it many, many times until they can do it well. Yeah. 
And you can make them as simple as you want, um, as complicated, depending on the level of your, your student. So those are handy little tools uh, to use too. So that was dialogues and jazz talks. Oh, repetition and correction. Lots of repetition needed to break old habits and don't be afraid to correct. Um, if they want to learn pronunciation. If they don't want to learn, then you're just going to make people unhappy, don't worry about it. But if they want to learn, then do correct because they want it. Now, the next one is imitation of incorrect pronunciation to help them hear the difference. If somebody says to you, vote, and you know they're trying to say vote, and you can say vote 50,000 times at them, and they're not going to get it until you say, not vote, vote. So sometimes you have to tell them what they've said because they haven't heard what they're saying. If they heard it, they would do it right, mm -hmm. you know? Uh, so there are times that you need to imitate what the student is saying so they can hear themselves and then tell them what the other way is, and that will help. You just do it in a nice way, you know? And usually it's not a problem. Um, you know, if, if uh, they all already knew all this, they wouldn't need you, so. Mm -hmm. Oh, wood is the is Spanish speaker. Oh, yeah. Yeah. For some reason, and I actually haven't figured this one totally out yet. The W and G. There's this thing in Spanish. W does not actually exist in Spanish as a letter. Uh, so, but the G does, and it's the, the most the closest letter is a G. Now, a G in general, you know, it's pronounced back in here. So, uh, they. Spanish speakers will say good and guman and gork instead of wood, woman, and work. So really work on work on pronouncing it with the lips, not with the voice, not back here. It's a lip thing, and that's how we get that wood and work. And the best way I found is you, first of all, you find something they can do, such as we, right? It's the W-O that's a problem. So you go we, 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 we work. And then you get the one they have, do it several times so it comes out easily and smoothly, <coughs> then throw in the difficult one. Mm -hmm. But they've already got that pattern going, the we, 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 we will, we will work, that kind of thing. So, and then you show them, this is where you pronounce it. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah, that's an interesting one. Somebody told me when I went to study in Mexico a bazillion years ago that uh, there was a gulgorths in their town. <laughs> and I'd never heard of gulgorths. <laughs> Even though I had worked at Woolworths, <laughs> but it never occurred to me that was the same thing. And we got downtown and she goes, see, Gulgorts. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, they, it does help when you know where they're coming from, you know, what the problems are. Um, imitation of incorrect, we got that. Oh, here, here's the one that's maybe a little controversial, but I think it helps. Encourage students to imitate English speakers speaking their language using the English muscle sounds and intonation. Have them imitate someone who doesn't speak their first language well with an English accent. And I do this in my Spanish class. I, I suggest to my students, we are going to practice speaking English with a Spanish accent because this way you are using the muscles you use when you are talking in Spanish. And if you can do it in English, you can do it in Spanish. And you do the same thing with your students. Get them to imitate. Go ahead and say something in their language with an English pronunciation and have them imitate you because Sometimes the meaning is getting in the way, and sometimes they can do, do it. And they've heard people speak their language, especially if they're coming from English, they've heard it um, not really well done sometimes, and so it can help. Um, books and websites, there are a bazillion of them out there. There isn't one in particular, uh, except the one I showed you for the website that I really like. There isn't one in particular that say, this is it, just play around and see what you find that, that can work for you or help your student. Um, there are so many books and so many different resources that I just, I pick and choose. I don't, there's nothing in particular, no particular book that I use. But there's a lot out there for you. CD is to practice at home. Um, here's the practicing at home part. I, because I was so frustrated, and another partner teacher, we were frustrated with, Getting them to say it well in class and a week later having them come back with the old habits, we made up a pronunciation CD. And it corresponds to the transcript, which you have. So if you want to look at your transcript. Mm -hmm. Have you ever considered loading it onto an internet site? 
Well, we've considered it, but we've never gotten around to it. Um, Would you mind if you do it? Uh, let me uh, talk to my partner teacher and see what she says, if I'm fine with it. But um, So you'll see on this disk transcript, everything on here is what's on this disk. And so, for example, it does <coughs> vowels. Number one, short A. Open mouth wide, tongue down, and a little forward. Repeat. Ah, 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 ah. We do it five times. Ah, have, apple, and apple. I have an apple. And it gives time afterwards to repeat each sound. So the idea of using this is, after you have worked on a sound with the students, you say, work on this at home every day. And they don't have the person to feedback you know that they don't get, but they do get this, the practice with the same sound you've been working on, and so that can be useful. So as you can see, we start out with the vowels: short a, long a, short e, long e, short i, long i, short o, long o. Next page. Continue down through the vowels. Longs and shorts and, and diphthongs, the combinations. And then track two is schwa. And that's the one I wanted to tell you a little about just because <coughs> it's new to a lot of people. Number 16 there. Have you found that? I'm going to ask somebody else. Would somebody read that for us instead of me doing everything here? Sharon, would you be willing? Sure. Thank you. 16, schwa sound. Schwa is the neutral central vowel sound of most unstressed syllables in English. When speakers of English pronounce unstressed syllables, the vowel often sounds almost like short U, as in run, but with the tongue just a tiny bit higher in the mouth. This is called schwa. It is similar to the sound uh. More than one syllable in a word can be pronounced as schwa. The schwa sound is the most common sound in English. We see it in many dictionaries with this symbol. To pronounce the schwa sound, mouth open a little, tongue blow in the middle of the mouth. And then we just go, uh, 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 uh. So notice there, you have all these different letters, about, ago, agent, the, the. There's our typical schwa. We, we schwa that one most of the time. How often does anyone say the? We say the. Easily, happily, connect, bottom, focus, faithful, television, and patient. The bold ones are the ones we're schwaing. Well, schwa is just the word the linguists have come up with for that sound. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, because the short U is the uh, and schwa is more uh. It's not really any of our vowels. It's, this, it's because we've relaxed our mouth so much that we're not pronouncing it. And that's schwa. And if you look onto the next page, page three, up at the top, some more common words with schwa. That's just ones that we've noticed students have trouble saying. And they're always unstressed. Correct. That's right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, see? Yeah. Something and it's because <coughs> we're relaxing our mouths. That's why it comes out this way. We are very relaxed when we speak. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> oh, yes, and it depends on how quickly you're speaking. It depends on if you're emphasizing a particular word. Mm -hmm. For example, the, T-H-E. Okay. Mm -hmm. The only time you say this, you know, you may emphasize it and then you may say it. But the point is, most of the time we don't. It's relaxed. And that we're trying to get people to not say communicate, but communicate. Mm -hmm. and, but that's what they're going to hear. See, that's the thing, too. It doesn't, it's not really bad if they say the words more precisely than we do, but they may not understand it when somebody else says it because they're looking for an O or listening for an O or listening for a U and it's not there. So it would depend on, on the word. But um, I think it's a good thing to be aware of and for you to be aware of, even if you're not teaching your students about schwa, for you to be aware of. Well, and it's one a way also of explaining why English is so difficult to spell when you hear it. If you have your schooling arsenal, um, it helps you. 
Yeah, that all the different letters make this sound, and that makes it hard for it to spell it. You can't tell. If somebody says pencil, you don't know what's between the C and the L. I mean, unless you've memorized it, you certainly don't know by the sound. Yeah, it's a hard one. Number 17 is the er sound, which again is a very difficult and common sound. And then we go, the next track has some more difficult, the B, V, W, W, H, then the R and the L. So we just go through and work on all different sounds that we've noticed problems with. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, let's, we will want to, I've got an hour, right, till two? Okay, we're going to take some time near the end and we'll work on those EDs. And first of all, do you know why we pronounce them different ways? Okay, let's, we'll learn that and that will help your students learn why they're pronounced different ways. Why and the when of it. There is a right, there is reason to it. It's not random. Those EDs are not random. We have reasons for doing it and it has to do with that voiced and unvoiced. But we'll get to that in a little bit. Good. So this is a tool you can use with your students. It's a tool they can use at home. I brought some of these. If anybody wants one, you may have one. We'll pass them around. I brought 19, but anybody else who wants them, I can get them to you. Or we sell them at the Shot Center for $5. If you do need free reserve space, don't take one, but we'll give you Yeah. Um, and uh, it just goes through all these sounds. And then we have on page five, the ones we just call other important sounds that are difficult for people. <laughs> then on page six, consonant blends. Those, kill, those are killers. Yeah. Page seven, just common problem numbers and words that we have noticed as ESL teachers that we notice they have trouble with. They're as, as was pointed out, wood, woman, women. And then, what, what's the question? I was, well, I was just saying English doesn't make sense. Yeah, it makes it difficult. <laughs> <laughs> Aren't we lucky we got it as a first language yes. instead of a second one? <laughs> well, it doesn't even make sense. I lived in Scotland and it didn't make sense in Scotland. That's here. right. <laughs> nope. <laughs> Um, no, not even within this country. Minimal pairs on page seven. That's a minimal pair is when you have words that are exactly the same except for one little difference. And so a and a, a and a, a o, those kind of things. That that's the only difference in the word. So those are good to work on sometimes. So there's a whole section of this in the disc. And the very end is a couple of dialogues. So a few dialogues. So this is something that you can use with them if you like, if you think it'll be helpful for them, you can give it to them and let them take the disc home and work on, and on it with them. And I can send you the transcript electronically if you're interested. You can always email me with um, of anything you want that's uh, you want electronically. Any questions up to here? Yes? In what format will you send me this? It's a Word document. Oh, that's right. Bev has it, too. Right, because I sent it to her. Okay, so that's the, the CDs for practice at home and the disc transcript for classroom lessons and practice at home with the disc. The video. There's a neat video out there called Breaking the Accent Barrier. There's the phone number to get it. That works a lot on the muscle use and intonation. It's for kind of advanced students, though. This is not something for very beginners. He kind of talks a lot and but it really works on what's called the jump up, step down intonation of English. Um, my learner is, um, it's fine if I give her written homework, which I do, and she does the best she can. As far as speaking, she just doesn't seem to want to do it. Yeah, well, and if she doesn't want to, there's really nothing you can do. I don't want to do that, but when I've been with Jenny, then I get the dictionary and I look 
sit up and I'm doing my list and but I'm, I need to and she's a delightful student for sure. And but I it sounds like she's lacking confidence. I think so. Yeah, I'm and trying to, you know, give her confidence. Something I've seen quite a bit and I don't know if you've had this experience, but in teaching ESL, a lot of times when they have children that speak English rather well, mm -hmm. the children sometimes actually make fun of their parents when they speak English. Mm -hmm. And that I've heard as an issue. I've had students say, well, my daughter makes, teases me or makes fun of me. And, and if there's any way that you can enlist the kids to help the parents, that would be great. But a lot of times what they need is confidence to get rid of that no puedo attitude to, yes, I can, I can do this. And so a lot of what you may have to work on with her is confidence building. I mean, that's my guess from what you're saying. And then she might be more willing to do it. Another thing on working on a language, I suggest, uh, very short, very short periods of work several times a day rather than working on something for 10 or 15 or 20 minutes at one time. Um, uh, it seems to work better if you have repeated short um, exposures. Um, depending on what you're trying to have them do, if they're trying to you know, spell a word or whatever it is or just pronounce it that several times a day, but for a short period. So like if it's something sitting in the kitchen or in the bathroom, they walk in, because you're in and out of these rooms several times a day, to do it right then for 30 seconds, if that. That way it doesn't take up a big amount of time either. There was a question or a yeah, comment? Is there any kind of game in English at that child level that she could play and she could sort of fit in with them? Well, in, uh, well, I brought some different kinds of games, but they're, they're not really children's games. So, I mean, there certainly are whatever the kid plays. I, I don't know if they're playing what they're playing these days. Well, what's the best way to instill confidence? Just praise when she does it right. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. All by yourself, or as you say, in the shower. Yeah, right, in the shower. Yeah, that's true. That, or, or as you said, yeah, to a pet, or you know, you can have your imaginary friend or your puppet or whatever <laughs> that you can talk to. Yeah, th but that's a good idea because they might feel uncomfortable with somebody else. And I mean, the first thing is, if these people are coming for tutoring, you can praise the heck out of them for being there and doing it. You know, so right there, that that they're making this effort, they're wanting to better their lives, and you're here to help them, which is wonderful, and. Just, you know, but it's sounding like she really needs some confidence work. Yeah. Thank oh, we have so many comments. It's great. Um, I see we teach them the Arm Gate Pantry at Fox Scott and Leonard Javon. Do you have other material on your website that we could send out? Yeah, it's actually not a website. It's, these are just oh, my, okay. it's just my email. So okay. it's just, if there is something that I show you that you don't have a copy of you'd like, you can email me. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. But just another quick suggestion for the person who is reluctant to speak. Mm -hmm. uh, she could read a short story picture book to her child in English just to hear herself speaking English, but yet she's not a, having to generate it necessarily. Right, right. It's written down. Yes. Okay. And that serves a couple of purposes. Mm -hmm. I found that um, my girls, that I take home to Mm -hmm. And I want to cut the compliments to get what she wants. Real life English, yeah. yeah. And, and then have her get a boarder's card so she gets credit for actually using the language. You take her shopping to the store, she mm -hmm. says, what did you wear, what would you like? And she repeats the Spanish written English word mm -hmm. for the clothing that she would like to wear on a certain occasion. And we actually were using it. Yeah, that's great. I mean, that I makes it authentic. And you know, part of that problem is everywhere they go to order them here, everybody's bilingual or they can get rice. They can cut a crutch at Cripple Rice. So, right. But they might be English and they speak Spanish behind the counter. But I tell her specifically that you must do it in English. And then I tell the, the clerk behind the counter that she's going to practice her English. And then she makes the change and counts it back to her, the whole thing. 
<laughs> well, it, it, you know, that no puedo thing, that, that is a biggie, and, and it's, just, it's a long process. It's not like overnight you can change someone's self-esteem. That takes a while. And, it, and I've seen it ha change, though. I had a student that was that way. It was, it was, no matter what I asked him to do, it was, you know, no puedo maestra. And then her sister joined class. After a while, she finally got the message she could do it. And her sister said it. She said, yes, you can. <laughs> so it was, yes, you know? And so, yeah. And so it's, that's an attitude issue. Let, let me throw something out. One of our tutors actually has scheduled phone calls oh. with his learner. And every, you know, people have cell phones, and you can say, every day, I'm going to call you twice a day. I'm going to call you at 10 and 4. And even the conversation might be that she has to say, you would say, hi, how are you? And she has to say, how are you? And then you may talk a little bit. Yeah. And then and she has to say, thank you. There are just two things or one thing, as long as she's, how are you? That's repeated over and over again. And you have to pronounce well on the telephone. Right, and she knows who you are on the telephone. Mm -hmm. you identify, so it's not like a stranger, because that's the most paralyzing thing when you get a call in a foreign language <laughs> on the telephone. But actually, um, because face-to-face -face is much easier than the telephone, and if you only have one thing to say on the telephone, you practice it face-to-face -face and say, I'm going to call you, and then I want you to say, how are you, Anna? Well, or I call her a couple times a week, and yeah. she's, you know, she's <coughs> Okay, you know, I went to Yale and that's what yeah. I am. And then she, uh, in between, she'll say, oh, How am I supposed to do this with her? I said, You know, it's just mm -hmm. something like this, you know, and I'll be able to go ahead and do yeah. it. And so I said, Well, I'll call you again. I said, you know, and then we just call again. Yeah, that's you know, yeah, the telephone I is think good. Her motivation mm -hmm. is joy school. She's been here 10 years. Mm -hmm. Her husband speaks no English. And she just wants to be part of the group. You know what I mean? She yeah. wants to be able to learn the language in the country in which she lives. One of the things that can help your language learners, perhaps, is for them to understand that learning a language is an extremely long-term and complicated mm -hmm. item. And it doesn't help to see those ads on TV of learn English in 14 easy lessons without a teacher. <laughs> you know, that's what they're bombarded with. That's not reality. Um, stuff I was reading recently on language acquisition was saying that it takes seven years living in a culture fully immersed mm -hmm. yeah. to learn to really speak the language. And that we have this little tip of the iceberg that we are be able, able to see after a while, but it takes a long time. That language learning <coughs> is a really long process. It's a continual process, and we are all continuing to learn English all the time. We get new vocabulary in books we read, and that, that this is a process. It's not an end. And that might help them to understand that this can't do attitudes. Yes, she is doing. She is learning. It is slow, and maybe she's not doing something today, but in a few days she'll be doing it. And that it's a little by little thing. One of my favorite expressions in Spanish, poco a poco se va lejos. Yeah. Little by little we go far. And that's how it is with languages. Can I just ask your opinion on teaching, teaching teachers in English versus how much English teachers learn a lesson? Yeah. Because I feel like sometimes I'm not sure where you stand. Yeah. I don't want to teach people in English, but the percentage is like 75% of the lesson. Most, the, kind of the, the rule on teaching a language is you teach it in the language which will best teach the language. Most of the time, I would say it would be in English. At times, you're going to you shelter your English. And that's another whole workshop on sheltering. Sheltering is using when you have you have the knowledge being a, you know if it's a Spanish speaker using the cognates using the words that are almost the same they come from the same root. Um, of course, slowly rephrasing, rewording, not necessarily louder, but um, which a lot of people tend to do, but um, just using the language very slowly, a lot of visuals, drawing, acting out, that kind of thing. Because along with getting their English, it's a kick to get it in the first language. It's exciting when you get it. It's a bit of a thrill. And those of you who've learned a second language, wow, that was cool, I got that. <laughs> now it's also discouraging if they're not getting anything. So the first thing is your lesson has to be at their level. So it has to be extremely basic if they don't speak much English, really, really basic. You know, um, I would be surprised if there'd be any problem with you um, going to observe a very low-level ESL class sometime over in adult education. You can contact Jack Bailey um, to see if that's okay. And that would give you an idea of how does a low-level 
teacher work with the students. We, our policy in adult education is, I think it, it supposedly we're only supposed to use 5% of uh, their first language if needed. So we try to keep it down to a minimum. We know there are teachers who use a lot more. There are teachers who use absolutely none. And I've seen really excellent teachers teach level one with no Spanish whatsoever. Mm -hmm. All visual English. So if you're having to do a lot of Spanish with them, they, you may be trying to do stuff way over their heads. And so then you would just want to ratchet back what you're doing. But certainly there are times when it is so going to facilitate what you're doing and it's so going to help them that there are times that I, you know, I would say it's appropriate. But what you as tutors don't want to do is fall into, this is a cool way to, for me to practice my Spanish. So first of all, the apple. What's the difference between ah and ah? Yeah, what are you doing? What's the difference? How would you explain to make that ah? What are we doing differently? Ah, uh, eh. What else? What are you doing with your tongue? Play with it. Do ah, uh, eh, ah, uh, eh. Notice what your tongue is doing. Okay, so the, the sound, one is out, one is in. What one is out? Eh. Uh, your tongue goes forward for eh. Uh. It's back and low in the mouth for ah. Uh. So everyone goes ah, uh, eh. Uh. Just push that tongue forward, you've got your eh. Uh. So you got to get them to push the tongue forward. Oh, now here's an interesting thing. Yeah. There's the ah and the aw. And not everybody notices in the, the English speakers don't notice a difference. Okay, here's, let me give you a word here. Oops, wrong, wrong one. Doesn't matter which we use, I just want to blank. I want to see, how do you guys pronounce this word? How do you say that? Coffee. <laughs> That's where you're from, exactly. Coffee or coffee? coffee. I say coffee. I had a, te a teaching assistant, I noticed she said coffee, a cup of coffee. Yeah, and I thought, <laughs> well, th then, so then I looked in the dictionary and it had both. Uh -huh. So I'm going, oh, yes, we do have this little problem of the ah and the ah at times. And again, this is what they have to learn. We have some variability. It's coffee in New Jersey. It's coffee, yeah. in New Jersey. <laughs> it's coffee <laughs> here. <laughs> coffee in California. Orange and orange. Uh, yeah, orange and orange. Yeah. So there are a lot of words that are like that that are pronounced differently by different people. Mm -hmm. um, but that awe sound, that is, a, it's as well as regional, it's individual. There is individual variability. Mm -hmm. My husband talks about going to Vons, not Vons, to go shopping. He, ta he makes it an aw sound. I don't know where that came from, but it, that's how people are. I would say Vons. He says Vons. He makes it the aw, like taut. Here. <laughs> so, yeah, but there, there are, if you really start listening to people, you'll notice that we have variability. Well, oh, well, well, certainly, and there are regionalisms. There are regionalisms throughout Latin America. Each each region has its own accent, as does the United States. So they understand the Spanish. Yes, exactly. That there are different ways. Um, okay, short U. What sound is that? Uh. 
How do you pronounce? How do you teach them? Uh. Do you have trouble with uh? Up. Yeah, but can they say? Do they say up or up? Oh, good. If you don't have problems, I've noticed a lot of trouble with. Some teachers do this. They go up. Uh. I've seen them do that, and it helps. It gets them to do it. It's an up, up. <laughs> um, I don't usually do it, but I've seen that. Uh, long O. What's for, what makes our long O difficult for Spanish speakers? What's the difference between any Spanish vowel and English vowel? Basic difference. Well, they have that. There's one. Yeah, there's none of the short and long stuff. But the other thing is, hmm? there's no variance. There's no variance. When you pronounce a vowel in Spanish, you open your mouth, you let the sound out, then you can move things around. You do not move your mouth while you're pronouncing a vowel, unless you're doing two of them and you're putting them together. So you don't say for the word I, you say yo, not yo. Not yo. So for them to learn to do that, oh, we diphthong our sound, we move our mouth, we go, oh. So I teach them to go, oh, move the mouth while you're doing it, oh, no. He said, oh, no, okay, oh, no. But we do that, and that's part of the relaxing the mouth. That's part of this whole thing of, of using our mouth in a different way. And the schwa, of course, that's the, the most common sound, so I think it's one probably worth working on a little. How are you going to say your last sound? Schwa? Schwa? Oh, I didn't make it up. I can't, yeah, yeah. That sounds like it. It looks like it would. But I don't actually know. I've not found the word in other languages. I <coughs> only I found it in linguistic books for English. It, it, it would be Schwartz in German. Schwa. It would be a V. It should be Schwa of Deutsch. Yeah, could be. Um, words starting with S T, S C H, S K, and S P for Spanish speakers are a problem. Why are they a problem? Hmm? They want to put an E or an A. They want to put a vowel in front. And why do they want to put a vowel in front? <laughs> yep, we're going to work on that. Okay, so in Spanish, um, in Spanish, that's where our syllable is divided. You never have a consonant blend, an SC, an SP, an S anything. Mm -hmm. Even though they're together in a word, they're in separate syllables. Mm -hmm. That's why it's so hard for Spanish speakers. Even though they have, you know they have, whoops. Let's see if I can do this, it's always a problem. <coughs> it's divided here. It's S. Pa, no, not as an escuela, not escuela or español. So they do not put an S and any other consonant together like we do. So to do it, first of all, point this out to them. Help them understand that in English, this all goes together. We don't do it. Show them there's nothing in front of it. And then this is where you have to show them what they're doing, that you have to say, not speak, but Speak. So you start them going <laughs> hissing, just getting the sp. Practice the hiss first, and then the sp, and the sp, sp. You know. So you actually just start with them practicing it, going sp, and then add the other sounds. Because you can, as you've probably noticed, say Spanish, not as Spanish. You know, 15 times, but. You've got to actually practice doing that S without the uh in front of it. But if you, I found, you know, showing them, this is what, why, sometimes that helps. They understand. What about U O? O. O. Oh, oh, that's a killer. Um, one of the worst words is bottle. <coughs> um, oh. Again, teaching where the L is. The L, your, everything is down. Your tongue is down in your mouth. Relax. You've got to get that relaxed for the uh. Again, overemphasize it, relax it. Uh, uh, and then that tongue comes up right under the tooth. Got to get that tongue down. Oh, push the tongue forward. Oh, what word were you wondering about? What was it you were saying? Uh, just oh, just, oh, just the oh. Really for most it is. They're going to want to go oh. They're going to curl their tongue yeah, way back yeah. for that L. That's getting that L, that tongue down and flat for the L. 
which is where the pictures come out to show them that it's flattened out and lower and not curling up in the back like it is in Spanish. Oh, that's right. There is one little thing I didn't show you, I didn't put on there, that some teachers use, and it, you can do this. If you get, this is a, um, just a coffee stirrer. But one of the things you can do to teach when it, they're just having a heck of a time putting their tongue in the right place, you take one of these. Now, you have to have a close personal relationship with this person <laughs> because you're going to get close to them and you're going to be sticking this in their mouth. So it has to, you have to have the right relationship. You can't just walk up to any student and do this. <laughs> but what you can do, and you have two of them because first you show them what you're going to do on yourself, and then you show them on them but without, you know, with a different one, <laughs> is that you're going to touch where you want the tongue to touch in the mouth. So you touch the tongue and then you touch the place in the mouth. You want them to put that piece of their tongue to match it. That's one way. Another way is by using, and I use a transparency. Oh, did I get it out? I've got them here. Sometimes, For the L, I would actually try to get it down lower and put it under the teeth. I would have it go like this. I would touch their tongue and right there on the bottom of the teeth uh -huh. to get them to relax that tongue. Right I want the tongue here. Uh, cool. <coughs> Push it forward and low. Right. I also use a transparency, which is the inside of the mouth. You have to teach them what you got here first. And again, I've just taken out of a, off a website. I printed this up, and then I, you know, copied it on a transparency. And with the transparency, I will then use a pen sometimes and show them where the tongue is to go. I've I found this does help um, because sometimes you know you can't show them what's going on in their mouth. The website does it, but sometimes you really have to sit down and, and really be specific. I had a really hard time with somebody with a D one time, too, um, trying to do an English D. And until I tried every other trick in the book, including this guy, but when I actually showed them with a picture in the mouth, that helped. So that's how the L I do find. Showing them a picture of it, getting the idea, and I use the hand. This is your tongue, flat, low, teeth, under the teeth. That gets that L forward and down. E D. Yes, we want to do some EDs. Okay. <coughs> okay, let's see. You have an ED that sounds like a T, right? Mm -hmm. And you have an ED that sounds like a D, like in learned. Mm -hmm. And you have an ED that sounds like an ED, right? Mm -hmm. And then you've got, uh, if you're doing past tenses, irregulars, right? So. I would start out with a little chart like this. Everybody sees that? Yeah, you can see that, okay. So, give me some ED, well, what did you do yesterday? Give me one thing you did yesterday. I walked around the park. Walked. Which one does that go under? Column one, two, three, or four? <coughs> Oops, I'm gonna have to make this a little further over there. Okay, um, what did you do? I learned something new. And where does that go? D, column two. And what did you do? Nothing. <laughs> <laughs> I read. Red. Where does that go? It's an irregular, isn't it? Whoops. Yeah, right. <laughs> and what's one that's going to work here? Planted. didn't do what I wanted it to do. That's what I wanted to do. So uh, first of all, I start out and I make a big lists like this. What's, what are some more? Give me, just give me some words with EDs on them. Visited. Watched. Visited. Liked. We got a lot under this one, don't we? Listened. Mm -hmm. 
clean. Some more? Washed. Well, let's find out. Do we, do we have any more? Can you think of any more? What? Weeded. Yeah. Wanted. Weighted. Weeded. Yep, we have weeded and weighted. Oh, we already have weeded. Weighted. weighted. Slept. Yep. Curled. Curled. I'm glad you came up with another one because it's not only the N. Okay. Um. Oops. Any others? Seated. <coughs> we were seated by the varied oh buried and both of them work yep which is what i thought you said at first oh, so. okay. <laughs> it shows how difficult english is and we were native speakers yeah okay so let's see if we can find something in common with these things here Okay, the easiest one to see is the ED one. What what two letters give us that? T or D. If you have a T or a D, it's going to end in ed. There's your rule. <coughs> so that's rule number one. Remember we talked about voiced and unvoiced? Let's get our hands. 